Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I can see it's a uh, good afternoon, good evening, and it's a uh, good morning here from the UK. I'm currently in Wales in the UK, and I'm delighted to be with you all. And I'd like to thank Cambridge University Press very much for inviting me to talk to you today. Um, uh, as Bridget said, uh, I've been involved in teaching English as a second or foreign language for about 27 years now. And the last 10, 15 years, I've been involved in teacher training and working closely with Cambridge University Press on their uh, training programs and using their materials. So today's session, uh, we're looking at bringing English to life. Um, it's gonna be an interactive session. So I'd be grateful if you could respond to some of the polls that we're going to have and also use the chat box. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on it as much as I can. And I'm delighted to see uh, teaching colleagues from all over the world. So hello, Malaysia, I can see, South Africa, India, uh, Pakistan, Armenia. So we've got a, a wonderful range and I know there are many more of you uh, elsewhere in the world. So thank you very much for joining us. This is the uh, focus of today's webinar. Uh, focusing in particular then on students at the level of Cambridge IGCSE. Um, so we're looking really here at uh, you know, secondary level students. And we're going to look in particular at active learning. We'll see what active learning means. And I'm gonna try and give you lots of activities that um, have an active learning approach that you can put in your teaching suitcase and bring with you to the classroom. And hopefully ideas for when you use your course books, whichever course book that is, that you can adapt and change to engage and motivate your students. Because that's really a, a key aim that we have in our classrooms. Apart from teaching English, it's to motivate and engage our students so that they can learn and develop with us. So uh, my first uh, poll that we're going to launch in a minute is looking at the skills that our students need. So we'll put the poll on the screen and I'd be grateful if you could um, look at the question, which is an English teacher's main responsibility is to teach grammar and vocabulary. A simple yes, no question. Do you agree? So please show us what you think. Give you about 20 seconds to answer the poll. Give you another five seconds to make up your mind, yes or no. Okay, well, let's see uh, what you uh, believe about our main responsibility. Interesting, okay, so no is the overwhelming majority there that it's not our main responsibility to teach grammar and vocabulary. Thank you very much. Um, so the question is, if it's not uh, vocabulary and grammar, then there has to be something else. Perhaps uh, my next slide will reveal the something else. Of course, there are skills that we have to focus on as well, isn't it? Um, listening, speaking, uh, reading and writing, and pronunciation. And these are the traditional areas of English teaching. And of course, we are responsible for developing their vocabulary and developing their grammar. But perhaps the, that word in the poll, the main responsibility, main was the problem there because there are a range of other things. But in addition to this on the screen, which is the traditional approach, um, there perhaps are other skills that our students need as well. So in the chat box, could you put what other skills perhaps our students need in addition to these traditional language focuses? Great, I'm seeing critical thinking coming along and creative thinking. Speaking, I'd put under the four skills. So analytical skills, aha, uh -huh. values, nice. Yeah, so we're doing more than just English language. Lots of good C words here, communication, confidence, uh, being able to understand the context. Inference, that's a nice one, isn't it? So being able to look behind the writing of, a, of an author or the, when you read a text, what's really going on? Is there another message behind that? 
real life applications. Good. So although we are teachers working in the classroom, we are particularly at the IGCSE level looking beyond the classroom, perhaps. Uh, global skills, nice idea. So we're all part of a global community. Are we preparing our students to be part of that global community? The rights and responsibilities that go with that. Great ideas, thank you. So I put some on the screen that uh, connect with many of the comments that you put in your chat box. Um, these are often referred to as 21st century skills, but you'll notice I've put so-called. Yeah, I'm a little bit skeptical about the term 21st century skills. Does it really mean that these skills didn't happen 100 years ago, that people didn't need leadership, productivity, social skills? Of course, uh, media technology, that might have changed over the 100 year period, but people still had to cope with technology, whatever that was. So I'm not saying that these skills aren't important. They are important and they are valid and they probably should form part of our syllabus and our teaching as well. Uh, I'm just not sure about the term 21st century skills. Perhaps uh, the word life skills is a better one for that. And I like the fact that they can be divided into learning skills and literacy skills as well. So there's a lot going on in the English classroom um, that the skills that our students will need. I think there's a couple more things that I feel we should add uh, for the classroom and particularly our role as the teacher. And that is to help our students see that English lessons are meaningful and enjoyable. They need to understand why they're learning English. And it's not just for the exam, but that there's a bigger purpose to it than that. And hopefully we encourage them to enjoy the learning process, to encourage them to both continue in their secondary studies, but also perhaps go on to tertiary studies. And also to see learning as lifelong, that we do it all the way through our careers. Um, and that hopefully then will motivate and engage our students. And as I put on the screen, I don't think we should underestimate the importance of meaningful classes, enjoyable classes, and seeing beyond the classroom. Uh, and if we only go through a course book, question by question, or we do lots of exam papers, I'm not sure that will necessarily tick all those boxes of making it meaningful, engaging, and persuading our students that there's more to the learning process than just exclusively focusing on an exam although we know our secondary students can be particularly focused on exams. So the key for me then is to make sure that our lesson planning, our syllabus, all revolves around active learning. Because to me, the benefits of active learning are that it will support our students not only in becoming successful in their exams and reaching their potential there, but also developing the skills that they need for later in their academic studies or later in life. So what is active learning? Well, I've taken this little quotation from a very good book, English as a Second Language, produced by Cambridge University Press. Um, the cover of the book is on the screen. And in it then, the uh, definition given, uh, you can read yourselves, but the key words are that student learning is at the center and we're focusing on how students learn, not just on what they learn. So it's very much the process of learning and how we get our students involved in the learning process. So to break this down a little bit, I would say that active learning encourages our students to do more work than us. And that's surely a good thing when we're busy teachers. But by doing more work, it has to be engaged, meaningful, productive work not just busy work, doing lots of worksheets or gap fills. There has to be a real purpose behind it. And that purpose is to encourage independent thinking, as well as developing all the skills that they have. And to make our students independent also means that we should be involving them in taking responsibility for their learning, that they see that they play an active role in developing their skills. And it's not just us, the teachers, spoon feeding them. And to help them along this journey then, we should be trying to engage our students as much as possible. And again, that key word in a meaningful way and building up lots of collaboration, cooperative tasks, students working together, not just with the teacher. And to do that then, we can help our students to discover 
language, rules, patterns, how English works for themselves, perhaps working with others, rather than lecturing them about the language. Active learning is about them actively engaged in the learning process. And what does that mean then? Well, it means working out for themselves, discovering for themselves, carrying out research for themselves, and then reporting back to both the whole class, their group, their friend if it's peer work, and to the teacher as well. But summing this up means that the role of the teacher is moving away from that traditional person at the front who is lecturing and explaining. There may be a, a, a role for some explanation from the teacher, but it shouldn't be the dominant method. It shouldn't be the dominant methodology in the classroom. It should be the students working out um, what's going on in the text or from the listening or from the grammar rules for themselves. And by doing this approach or encouraging this approach, I would argue that all those skills that we've just mentioned, the 21st century skills, uh, making it meaningful and enjoyable, all that is covered and developed. So we're going to put another little poll up here, um, looking at active learning in your classroom at the moment. Am I just telling you things that you already know? So in this poll, we're going to look at your English lessons. I'd like you to think how much of the English uh, time in your lesson is spent, do you think, on active learning? So in my English lessons, the percentage of time spent on active learning is how much of your class do you think involves the students being engaged, actively discovering for themselves? So I'll give you 20 seconds, please, to answer the poll. Give you another five seconds. Great, thank you very much. So let's have a look. So the vast majority um, are doing at least half of their class. They're taking an active learning approach, which is good to see. And 12%. Uh, most of the class then involves the students engaged in student-centered activities, which is brilliant. Uh, those of you who perhaps are in the zero to 25%, um, perhaps there, there may be a, a good reason why you're doing less active learning. And hopefully then in this session, you'll be um, finding out about some activities that you could drop into your classes that would bump up the level of active learning. That's great, thank you for that poll. So all these things I would argue are very useful at uh, any level, but particularly for preparing our students then for tertiary level, the world beyond the classroom, uh, their exams. And in effect, therefore, it's uh, an approach that I would argue um, engages and motivates our students because we're putting them at the center of the classroom. And that is how I would say we, we can bring English to life, which is the focus of this webinar. So I've got five principles that I'd like to share with you for bringing English to life. Uh, they're on the screen and we're going to look at each one in turn. We've got activate interest, personalized learning, build in authentic communication, plan for variety, and make connections then with the world beyond the classroom. All those I think will help us to bring English to life. So let's have a look at the first one, which is activate learning. And the idea here is to get our students engaged from the very beginning of the class, activate their interest. And the important thing here is to activate their interest. And we can find out then from the information they give us at the start of the lesson, what their current knowledge is about the topic or the grammar point or the skill. And that therefore is a useful tool. It's an assessment for learning tool because we're finding out what they know before we teach and we can therefore um, change or adapt our teaching according to the results of what we find out at the very beginning of the uh, class or before the activity. Um, some of these uh, tools are quite obvious here. Uh, a couple we'll try out. 
obviously online poll, that's what I'm doing with you here. When you're engaged in a virtual classroom or an online classroom, it can be perhaps a little challenging to uh, engage and interact with students. But as we've seen, a poll is a way of doing that. And it works well with a large number of um, students. Uh, top right, we've got the topic is and the topic is not. Simple little activity. We give them a sentence which we ask them to complete. For example, active learning is, and they either will write that down or they maybe will tell their partner or in an online classroom, they could put in the chat box. So let's try it out. Active learning is, could you continue that sentence by writing in the chat box for me? What would you say? Active learning is, what are the key words? Into the chat box, please. Great ideas coming in here. I can see engaging. I like the idea of the stakeholder, the number one client, the most important client is our students in active learning. Great. Collaboration, certainly. Effortless. Hmm. It would be nice if it was effortless. I think there's a, a degree of effort involved in that. It's challenging, but it can certainly perhaps make it fun, both for the student and the teacher. Um, yep. The learners are doing more discovering and work than the teachers. Good. Can I switch it around then? So I've also got on the screen is not. So in the chat box, can you tell me then if we just pause? Active learning is not. How would you complete that sentence? Active learning is not. Right, more teacher talk. Good. Boring. Good. Yeah, so the opposite of active, passive. That's what we're trying to get away from, passive students. Mechanical repetition, fair enough, yes. Not one way, I like that idea. So it's natural communication engagement, yep. So perhaps rather than, uh, yeah, it's not one way communication, good. It's not the teacher lecturing. Great, good. So it's a very simple activity to do. It works well online with the chat box and you immediately get to see then what your students are thinking about. If they've got any misunderstandings, you'll find that out and then you can uh, adapt your teaching to it. Some of the others then are uh, just perhaps explain a little bit more in case you're not familiar with them. So an, a nice way to start the lesson, of course, is with an introductory uh, video. The idea here with a video, of course, we all use videos, we show them the video and they watch it. It can be a little bit passive though, watching a video. Is it much different from the teacher lecturing or the video lecturing? Now, of course, there's lots of great imagery and there might be music and it might be more engaging for students, but its basic form is kind of just giving input to the student. So perhaps we can think of ways of adapting how we show a video and the phrase I put at the top, which we're going to get a lot of, is information gap activities. For communication to take place, then there usually has to be some kind of gap where I want to find out information from another person or from the video. And by creating this gap in information, we encourage uh, our students to talk or listen and find out the missing information. And I'd argue we could do the same with a video. So the technique that I often use with my students is showing the video, but not with the sound, with the sound off. So then they're engaging with what they see on the screen and they're predicting and guessing and perhaps asking questions to themselves or their partner in their group. What do they think is going on? And that is then trying to bridge this gap of seeing something, but not really knowing what's going on on the screen. So just to demonstrate that, I thought uh, we could watch uh, a nice video that has been produced by Cambridge uh, University Press. So I'm just going to uh, come off my PowerPoint slide and uh, there's no sound, so don't worry if you can't hear anything. What I'd ask my students to do then is as they watch the video to just perhaps say aloud to themselves or their partner what they think they can see on the screen. There are some questions on the screen, so that's nice to help the teacher. Uh, and we'll just watch a, a minute or so of it. So have a look. What do you think is happening on the screen? 
let me find the video. Okay, so the topic of the lesson is going to be environment and it's our impact on the planet. So there's no sound. As you watch it, try and predict what you think the content is and what type of vocabulary would we be using then in this lesson. Here we go. Global warming is the long-term heating up of the Earth's climate due to human activities. sea levels rose by about 20 centimeters in the 20th century. Okay, so that gives you a little idea of the topic here. Hopefully the types of language that was coming up, things like so Arctic melting, global warming, pollution, deforestation, um, some kinds of, uh, yes, human activity, environmental issues. So the students would be generating ideas, content, language that hopefully we would then pick up as the class continued. And again, I'd be able to find out from what they were saying, whether they had the vocabulary, the knowledge, the ideas. But it's getting the students there, not just passively listening to the video, but as I said, um, trying to work out without the sound, what the message is that's being communicated. And that kind of lies at the heart of real communication, trying to um, engage with and work out the message that either the video or the speaker is giving to us. So the other activity I put on the screen, KWL, if you're not familiar with this, the K stands for uh, I know, the W stands for I want to know, and the L, what I have learned. And the idea here is at the beginning of the class, we can find out what students know about the topic or the grammar point. And we can also then give an information gap here, which is the second one, what do they want to know? So what students want to know before you start teaching? What's the gap in their knowledge or awareness that they themselves would like to learn about in the class? So again, it's putting students at the center of the class. And then at the end of the lesson, we come back and review what they have learned. So KWL, it's a nice strategic tool for the start of the lesson with the K and the W, and at the end of the lesson for what I've learned reviewing and reflecting. And another activity is, of course, using visuals. And in the Cambridge University Press resources, we have great visuals, um, but you can bring in your own visuals as well. And again, not just showing a visual, but perhaps trying to engage and get the students to predict what they're seeing as they did with the video. So we can use a video to elicit both content and language from them. And one simple technique of that is a slow reveal where you don't show the full image, as I've done on the screen, you can blank it out. So students have to really look hard and they predict and they guess. And again, that's activating their knowledge and language and hopefully their interest. So in the chat box, what do you think this is a picture of? Um, great, got some ideas coming here. What can you see? Right, let me reveal a little bit more to see if that helps you. So what's going on in this picture? Why are you seeing that? What's connected with it? What might be the topic? Oh, we've got some nice ideas in the chat box here. Good 
good. So we've moved away from just a gymnasium, just sport. There's something more in this topic, isn't there? Yeah, good. Let me take that away. So yeah, nice ideas coming out in the chat box. That's right. And therefore the topic is sport and health and fitness, but it's looking at people with disabilities who are still carrying out sport and health and fitness. As somebody said in the chat box, they're overcoming their disability and they're taking a full and active part in the, in, in the gym session as well. So again, we're getting vocabulary, we're getting ideas, and hopefully that will motivate students now to read or listen to this gentleman and what's going on in the story. So that's a slow reveal technique. Very easy to use with PowerPoint slides. Equally in a face-to-face -face classroom, you just cover it with paper and then remove the paper a little, little by little. Active learning though is also about, I would argue, personalizing learning, making sure that students make a personal connection with what they're learning and doing. And the simplest way of doing this is to get our students to ask and answer questions. So for each topic, we can ask our students the questions on the page. And by making them connections with their own lives, their own interests, again, that brings English to life, their own life, their own community life, and it involves them in the, um, in the topic. So if they don't have any experience of the topic, of course, we could ask them, would you like to do this? Would you uh, like to be this person? Would you like to experience this? So again, a little poll we're going to put up on the screen. Um, when we're personalizing learning, what is the number one reason do you think your students are learning English for? And you'll see a number of options here. One of them is personal interest. At secondary level, uh, are our students personally interested in learning English or are there other reasons? It's a single choice, I'm afraid, so I'm gonna force you to um, decide what the number one reason. Of course, there may be many reasons, but what do you think is the number one? That if you asked your students, why are you studying English? What would they say? Give you 20 seconds. So there is the all of the above if you do want to have your one single choice as all of them or none of the above if you don't think any of those match your students. All right, five seconds and then we'll reveal the results. Oh, great. So over 50% think all of the above. Okay, so your students do have more than one reason for it. Personal interest, we've actually got zero that perhaps at that age group, teenagers. Oh, of course, all of the above. No, let me skip that. All of the above means yes for personal interest as well. I'm misunderstanding the poll myself. Certainly passing an exam comes up quite high as well. But no, it's good to see then that there are a variety of reasons and your students also have a variety of reasons behind uh, learning. Thank you. Uh, English is compulsory, right? So they have no choice in it. But hopefully within that lack of choice, um, they may still have reasons for learning or trying to develop their English. Okay, so um, in the course books, we often have uh, kind of pair work activities, uh, information gap dialogue activities, and one I've given you on the screen. This again comes from the Cambridge IGCSE materials. The idea behind this is when working with your partner, you're setting up an information gap by asking and answering questions. If you don't know your partner, you don't know about this particular topic, then you've got that gap in information and uh, you, you get to find out hopefully interesting facts or opinions or beliefs from your partner, which you can then share together or with the rest of the class. So part of active learning is trying to bring in variety into our lesson. And the one at the top I've put interaction patterns. How many interaction patterns can you name just in your head? What do we mean by interaction patterns? Of course, one of them is the student working on his or her own. That would be one interaction pattern. How else can we organize the classroom?
Yeah, group work, pair work, good. And then you've got the whole class activity as well. So trying to build that into our lesson planning, I think is a really key part of active learning and engaging our students. If it's always the teacher talking to the students, that's very passive. The more our lesson plan has pair work, group work, that means by its nature that we are involving our students in the learning process. But we can also have variety in terms of the input we give, whether we're talking or they're reading something or listening to something or watching a video, and also their output. What are they doing with this language, with this knowledge? Are they speaking? Are they writing? Are they making a project? And the various tools that we use as well in the classroom. Are we just using the whiteboard and the course book or are there other things that we can bring in? And in an online environment, what are all those tools that we can use? And we'll look at that in a moment. Also in terms of homework that we set, are we always asking them to complete a course book or uh, a workbook? And in terms of assessment, uh, do we give variety in the ways that we assess our students or is it always just a quiz or a formal assessment? So here are the variety of interaction patterns that we need to bring into our lesson planning. Uh, variety of inputs. Again, the student could also provide the input. They could do some research and then tell their friends, tell the class. In terms of outputs, we could also get them involved in recording things. It doesn't have to be live oral presentation. And project work by its very nature is collaborative. That gets them actively involved. Tools in the online classroom. I'm demonstrating a few of these today. Generally speaking, we have at our disposal, if we're lucky and we have um, certain platforms that we can use, we have all these types of tools. And if we can bring these into the um, online classroom, then it gives students variety and it allows us to engage with them. Online learning is often seen as challenging, but by using these tools, we can perhaps get the students beyond the screen to engage with us. You're probably familiar with all of them. Uh, the one I'd like to just focus on, camera on, camera off. I use that technique when I ask a question. If the students say yes to the question, they keep their camera on. If they're going to say no, then they switch their camera off, but they can keep their microphone on. So I can see with gallery view which students are agreeing or which students are disagreeing by whether I can see them or not see them. And then I can follow up with questions. So using the camera is a, a useful tool. And if you're lucky enough, of course, breakout rooms allow us to create pairs and groups as well. Homework tasks. Um, what do we do with our homework then? Of course, we can just give them a course book or workbook to complete, but there are other things. Again, a little poll, please, on the screen. Do you set homework? Is it important? So the question here is how often do you set homework? Give you another five seconds and then we'll find out about homework in your context. Okay, so the majority going for sometimes, so it does seem to play a part in our classrooms. Always, almost 40%, that's pretty high. Okay, thank you. So in terms of homework, what can we do? Well, in a flipped classroom, we can encourage our students to read or perhaps listen to something or watch some input before the class as homework, and then they're gonna report back into the class. Or we can get them to do research or investigate something as homework. We could get them to take photos or find images and then bring those to class if they relate to the topic. They could perhaps make a, a short video at home using a tool like Flipgrid. And again, they could bring it to class. So we could move beyond just kind of gap fill writing activities, planning for variety. In terms of assessments, um, the variety of assessment here, of course, the teacher will assess them, but perhaps at times their partner can assess or uh, they assess themselves as well. So the idea here is assessment doesn't just have to be students handing in work and the teacher grading it. We can look at other ways of doing that. So an active learning class is all about communication and it doesn't have to just be then communication with the teacher, but it can be communication with other students. 
Are you familiar with all these types of activities on the screen? Thumbs up in the chat box, thumbs down if you're familiar with all of them. They all involve a degree of communication and students working together and teaching each other. Are you familiar with all of them? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Okay, that gives me a good idea. So I'm just going to briefly run through them, uh, perhaps just to refresh your memory and perhaps to encourage you to occasionally be putting these into your lessons if you're not already. And again, in a virtual classroom, they're still possible because we have these tools that allow us to collaborate and share. So first type of uh, peer teaching, of course, is getting our students to investigate grammar for themselves. They can uh, be following an inductive approach to grammar where they investigate and uh, they're supported by questions in the textbook that get the students to work out for themselves the rules and the patterns, and they then record their own information. And again, this comes from the Cambridge IGCSE English as a Second Language course book. Students carry out these activities to work out the grammar for themselves rather than the teacher lecturing them about the grammar. Jigsaw reading is a, another way of getting students to collaborate. Um, it's a more indirect way of teaching, but students then are reading a text, uh, which they then share with their friends. So how this works is we take a text like this one on the screen. It has a similar topic, so it's looking at different um, places to visit. And half the class will read the text on the left, half the class will read the text on the right. They will investigate and explore the text, and then they will come back and form new pairs, and they will share the information that they were reading. So students discover for themselves what's in the text, and then they teach it to their friends. Again, there's a real purpose for communication behind that by splitting up the text and giving them the chance then to um, show their friends what they have read and learned. And of course, then everybody can read the whole text at the end, and they've been supported by listening to their friends who've given them information. A similar way of variety is a poster carousel. It's an alternative to a jigsaw where each individual or each group takes responsibility for a text, and then they will transform this information into a poster or a diagram using words and images. And then one person will present what they have read about to uh, rotating groups of students. And that's the meaning of the carousel. So one person presents what they found to students who move around the classroom listening. And the presenter then gets the chance to present perhaps two or three times. Again, it's very collaborative and it's forming that communication gap. A reading circle, also uh, useful. Instead of having different texts, as in the jigsaw reading or the poster carousel, this time it's one text um, and students then are reading the same text, but they're exploring it from different angles because they are given different roles as they are reading it. The idea here is they investigate the text as a group, they teach each other, and again, there's a purpose for communication. As a group activity, each student has a different role, and the traditional roles in a reading circle, you can see on the screen, a discussion leader, a word master, a summarizer, a passage person, a connector, or a visualizer. Giving you a bit more details about it, the discussion leader is kind of the mini teacher of the group who leads the discussion. The word master is in charge of the vocabulary. The passage person then will focus on one sentence, one paragraph, they will teach that if it's an important part to the rest of the group. The summarizer obviously summarizes the text. And the last two, the connector makes connections between the text and the life of the students or the school or the community. And the illustrator transforms key information in the text into a visual representation. You can change and adapt those roles, but the idea then is that each student takes responsibility for a different aspect when reading the text. And the kind of text I'd use would be one similar to uh, the one given on the screen. There are multiple paragraphs and it's an opportunity here for you to be able to um, focus on different aspects of the text. These slides will be available for you later as I sort of move through them quite quickly. And if you put into a search engine reading circle, you'll find lots of good examples of how to carry it out. We can also add peer evaluation into peer teaching. 
And one technique that I find particularly useful for doing this is a dictogloss. We're all familiar with dictations. That's a kind of traditional way of the teacher giving information and the students have to write down what was done. But a dictogloss is more student-centered. The idea here is that you have a text that you want the students to learn about, and the teacher is going to deliver that text and the students are going to listen to it, but they're not going to listen to it in a traditional dictation way by writing down every word. Instead, they have to listen and get the general picture and then reconstruct the text. And they get a chance to do this individually. So they're listening to the teacher, taking notes on what the teacher's saying. They then use these notes working with a partner to build up the text as much as they've understood it. And then I build up from pairs working together to a group working together. So everybody pulls their notes together and they're reconstructing the text that they heard from the teacher. And then the final stage would be them comparing their group text with the original text that the teacher gave them. So it's not a word for word dictation, but it's involving listening skills, reading skills, looking at grammar, vocabulary, and it's looking at communicating. And the evaluation here, what one student heard might be correct or it might not be correct. So their friends get to decide whether they would like to keep the first draft or they'd like to amend and adapt it. Again, if you put Dictogloss into a search engine, you'll find some great examples of how to carry out this technique. It works by integrating all these skills and it's very analytical as well as being very communicative and collaboration is required. So for me, it's an ideal um, tool or strategy or activity for active learning. Finally then, I think active learning, it's important to make connections between what we're doing in the classroom with not only the exam they're focusing on, but also perhaps showing them why they're studying this topic or this language, because it will be useful at tertiary level or in the world of work or the world beyond the classroom. And to do that, therefore, I, I try to, in my classes, always be explaining why we're doing an activity before we do it, reflecting on what happened in that activity, what did they learn from it, not only in terms of language, but also in terms of skills. So I try and build in, in the last five minutes, some kind of plenary reflection stage where students get to work on their metacognitive skills, thinking about their learning. What are they learning? How are they learning? Why are they learning that? And that therefore makes English not just a, a subject or something compulsory that they have to do, but puts it into a wider context of why it's important, not just for the classroom or the exam, but for later life. So to sum up then, those would be all the points that I think need to be covered if we want to engage our students. And it sounds a lot, but it's really tweaking or adapting activities in a course book, making them perhaps come to life, be more collaborative, be more meaningful. And I'd argue that all those tools are not extras that are nice to have, but they're actually a fundamental part of the English language classroom. And they will by themselves provide the skills that our students need to be successful in their examinations. Okay, that's all the input from me for now. So uh, very happy to take any comments or questions that you have. And uh, as George has put in the chat box, we will be sharing the slides with you, um, particularly if you want to focus on the reading circle information. Thanks so much, Jonathan. That was really useful, some really useful practical strategies. And I can see um, comments coming through to that effect as well. Um, we've got two questions so far in the Q&A box, but do keep putting them in so we can try and answer them in this session. Um, so the first is from Rochelle saying, how do you manage your time when giving active learning activities? It's a good point, isn't it? Um, I think it goes back to what I said about not viewing them as extra additional activities, but trying to just adapt or uh, tweak some of the activities perhaps you have to get through in your syllabus. So if you do have to work your way through a course book, it's just looking at that course book activity and um, still covering all the information and the activity itself, but just looking at ways that you could bring in a bit of pair work or a bit of group work. Um, so trying to see it as useful time. I think it's worth focusing on those types of activities where students perhaps are learning more and in greater depth than trying to rush through every activity in a course book, perhaps at a superficial level where students aren't engaged and they're not interested. 
And part of a skill, I think, as a teacher is knowing what to include in the classroom and what not to include. Hopefully nobody has to do every single activity in a course book or a workbook, but you'd select what was useful. And by selecting, you're perhaps increasing the amount of time that you have. And by building in those activities, therefore, you can still carry out that reading text or that listening text, but in a more engaging, motivating way. And if students are engaged, then they're probably learning. If they're just completing the gap fills and practice papers, okay, you've covered those, but are they really learning it? Is it really uh, a good use of time? We always want more time, as I do on this webinar, of course. <laughs> but thanks, Jonathan. Um, yes, got another question from Newell here. So my students are having difficulties with English listening, mainly because of the RP accent. Is there any useful techniques I can use to help my students? Thank you. Mm. Again, great question. So going back to accent, um, I'd say that, I mean, there isn't one accent that we want to encourage our students to use. And uh, I believe Cambridge Assessment, they have a variety of accents in their materials. Uh, and it's not just British English, but you get Englishes from around the world, because it's an important thing for our students to be able to understand different accents. So obviously, they need to understand the teacher, that doesn't have to be RP. We can give them a video input, audio input, and that probably nowadays has a range of accents. Um, I'd be surprised if everything was received pronunciation. One thing again with uh, listening skills, um, the more we can work on the students' own pronunciation skills, the better actually they get at listening because they get used to the idea that words are not pronounced separately in a robot way. If we can build up their pronunciation skills of you know, linking sounds together, using contractions, if they get used to producing it themselves, then when they hear these contractions and connected features of speech, that um, probably makes it easier for the, them to understand. I think the key is really to expose them to a wide variety of accents. And I certainly know that Cambridge has a wide variety of accents. So um, try not to just focus on, on RP. What is RP? Does anybody speak it? Probably not. So um, yeah, try and engage students in many different listening contexts. Definitely, thanks Jonathan. Um, next question from anonymous attendee. So in EFL contexts, motivating students and personalizing learning aren't that easy. What activities could you suggest? I suppose you've, um, you've outlined quite a few already, but um, is there one in particular that um, is your favorite? Well, I, just, I, I bring up that point about it's not easy to personalize. I think it is easy to personalize. I mean, every single topic, you can ask those types of questions to students. What's your experience? What's your opinion of it? If they have no experience, would you like to do it? And, and that's fairly quick and easy that you can do after any reading or after any listening. Um, so, Obviously, as the teacher, you're aware of the context in which your students are operating. You're just, I think, trying to bring in examples from their daily life, from their community, to supplement the course book if it's not produced in your country. And that personalizes it as well. So just try and make connections all the time between what they're reading about or listening about um, to, their, to their own lives, their own school. Uh, and I think that can be done at any stage in the classroom. Um, how often in a five-day week, this is a question from Batuli, um, how often in a five-day week class would you advise active learning to happen? Um, I'd advise it every lesson of every day of the week, really, uh, because otherwise it means what are you doing? If you're not doing active learning, then you're standing at the front and you're lecturing or students are just going through a course book. As you can see, active learning is just little tools and techniques and strategies. It's not um, just one activity, it's the whole approach to learning, setting up pair work when students have answered a question, get them to check their answers in pairs before they give the answers to the whole class. That is active learning, getting students to reflect on the activity, what did they do well, what didn't they do well. So again, I'd say that can come into every lesson. And in fact, almost every stage of the lesson, you can be building in small aspects of active learning without doing a whole reading circle. So just with, when you get the slides, look back at those um, small activities and techniques that I've been talking about, um, the variety of interaction patterns, variety of input and output. That's all part of active learning. 
Thank you. Um, I've got one more from Liang Shetty. So in the ESL classroom, how much scaffolding should be used? Uh, lots of scaffolding. I mean, scaffolding here means supporting our students, isn't it? So we need to be supporting our students with their um, understanding of input. So giving them vocabulary before they read or before they listen. Those pictures that we had that elicits vocabulary and content, that's all part of scaffolding. And then the output, they're going to need support in when they're speaking. Do they have models that they can listen to? Do they have sentence prompts? Do they have vocabulary they can use? Do they have cue cards if they're giving a presentation? If they're doing writing, going through a drafting process or giving them a skeleton framework, that's all part of scaffolding. So I'd say at every stage, we're supporting our students. We're giving them the language and the content skills they need to be able to carry out an activity. And of course, with scaffolding, as we know with a building, it comes down eventually. So once they have enough support, then the students can um, you know, progress to the next level. But at the next level, they still need support, but it's a different kind of support and scaffolding. So all the time. <laughs>